You know, as Blake said, we are truly dependent upon the Lord by his spirit to move on our hearts and make our coming together here worth your while and worth the investment that you are going to pour into the lives of those who are around you. You know, the topic uh, that I chose for this morning's discussion, I think, needs a little explanation or it's going to sound a little nonsensical to you. But the title of what I want to talk to you this morning is Church at Maine, not Church at Maine. That doesn't make sense, but I hope it will by the time I'm finished. You know, when theologians use the word church with a capital C, they are referring to all true believers. And so when I say church at Maine, it's church with a capital C because I want you and I to move in a direction that would lead us to true belief and that we will never be church lowercase c at Maine because that church is mixed with a conglomeration of true believers and those who are pretending to be believers or those who are just among us and have no interest in being believers. So I want you to be committed to church, capital C, at Maine. And we'll see this borne out in the scripture that God has given me to present to you this morning, 1 Corinthians 2, 6 through 16. We'll understand why it's critical for you and I to be church, capital C, at Maine, because our neighbors, our kids, our friends, and even our enemies need us to be church at Maine. That's what Paul was talking about when he was discussing verses 6 through 16 with the church at Corinth. Now, I want to read uh, the entire 10 verses to you, and then I'm going to uh, speedily expound upon it, and then I, I trust that as God is implanting his word in your heart, that you will take it from here and live it out there. Again, 1 Corinthians 2, 6 through 16. Yet we do not speak wisdom among those who, I'm sorry, yet we do speak wisdom among those who are mature. A wisdom, however, not of this age, nor of the rulers of this age, who are passing away. But we speak God's wisdom in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages to our glory. The wisdom which none of the rulers of this age has understood. For if they had understood it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But just as it is written, things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard and which have not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. For to us, God revealed them through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, the thoughts of God no one knows except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God so that we may know the things freely given to us by God, which things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, combining spiritual thoughts 
with spiritual words. But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually apprised. But he who is spiritually apprised all things, yet he himself is apprised by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he will instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. That ought to get you motivated right there. That ought to get you motivated. These 10 verses are theologically rich. So rich that it would take weeks to expound upon them fully. But uh, I don't have weeks, and I, I know you're glad. Um, <laughs> so we'll move forward. But verse 6, starting with verse 6, Paul begins to tell us that we do speak wisdom among those who are mature. A wisdom, however, not of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are passing away. Herein Paul is telling us something about ourselves and the world. He's talking about you. You are, you have been, you are being spiritually apprised, lifted up, informed by the wisdom of God. Now that ought to amaze you. God has given you access to his wisdom. A wisdom that the world cannot know, will never know. And he says this wisdom is shared among those who are mature. Now that places a heavy responsibility on the leaders of this church. It places a heavy responsibility on the pastor. It places a, heavily, a heavy responsibility on the elders and the deacons and the deaconesses of this church. They are, I shouldn't say burdened, although I suspect sometimes it does feel like one, but they are responsible for helping you and I become mature believers who are utilizing the wisdom of God to live faithfully to the word of God. That's a heavy responsibility. It's a heavy responsibility for them, and it's a heavy responsibility for you, because you are then required to live that wisdom out in the world so that those who are disconnected from Christ can see how God is working in the lives of his people. You are indispensable to what God is doing in the world through church with a capital C. And so once we made this commitment, uh, you know, I like the word Rubicon because uh, the word Rubicon means that once we've crossed the line, there's no going back. It's irrevocable. We can't change. You who've committed yourselves to Christ, you have crossed this Rubicon. And so you are required to be that church as leaders and as individual members of the body of Christ. Why? Because the world needs a church. The world needs a church, a mature church church. And what's interesting about this word mature, this telos, uh, it, is, it, it means the natural end of a thing. You represent the natural end that takes place when Christ invests himself through the Holy Spirit in your life. You naturally look like God. You're supposed to naturally look like God in the world. And so as we share with one another, there's a spiritual maturity that ought to manifest itself in this house. We ought to see, the world ought to see that natural maturity. And I think one of the reasons that Paul wants to talk to the people of Corinth, the Christians in Corinth, about this telos, this wisdom that naturally matures us, is because Corinth was a very, very wicked place. It was the Las Vegas of its day. 
And in the Las Vegas of his day, God is asking his people to share his Sophia, his wisdom, with those who are passing away in an age that is passing away. You see, it will not always be this way. There is a second coming. And Paul kind of addresses that later on in these verses. But because there is a second coming, that means there's a judgment. And God says he will. When he comes to judge, he will judge without mercy. None of us knows what that looks like. None of us knows what it looks like for a God of love to become a God of judgment who will judge people without mercy. And because we're living in between grace and judgment, God needs a church with a capital C to be an example to those who are lost so that he might gently usher them in, that they might be part of the family of God, so that they can partake of this Sophia, this wisdom. Now, Sophia means one who is skilled in managing life's affairs. The knowledge and practice that requires, that is a requisite for godly living. God wants you to connect with his wisdom so you can be a manifestation of a skillfully lived life according to his word. That's why you are indispensable. The world needs to see that skillfully lived out life and the benefits that manifest itself in a skillfully lived out life. Do we look like that? Do we act like that? Do we want that? And if the answer is yes, it means we've all got work to do. We're going to be stumbling along the way, but as long as there's that consistent passion to reflect the heart of God, then 1 Corinthians 6 through 16 is going to be realized in this church and it's going to be realized in our lives as individuals. And not only will the church benefit from it, but the world will benefit from it. Our families and our children will benefit from it. So, what did Rome uh, look like as a governing authority? And what did Corinth look like under the influence of Rome? Well, as I said, Corinth was the Las Vegas of its day. It has a very long history. Before it was a Roman state, it was a Greek city state. And so it had these hundreds of years of influence of walking the wrong way. And this is why it's part of the the age that is passing away. They have consistently walked in a way that is contrary to God. Under Roman influence. Uh, Corinth was rich in its worship of the gods. There were over 12 gods with large temples or many temples in Corinth. At one time, there were as many as a thousand temple prostitutes that uh, service the community. you, you would think, you know, a man had to make that up. Uh, nobody with any sense, no woman with any sense would um, uh, develop temple prostitution. But that was very, very much part of the culture in Corinth. Uh, sacrificing uh, a, a, a food to the gods was a business in Corinth. And we see where Paul encourages us to be mindful of the the food that we partake that's been offered up to idols. It was a business in Corinth. The Olympic Games were practiced in Corinth. Corinth was a very wealthy city, a luxurious city. But as part of the Olympic Games, some of the the games uh, men would perform naked. It was just, it was part of the culture. Uh, And and, and this was an offense to Jews. But this was part of the natural atmosphere with respect to the city of Corinth. And so God needed a people. 
connected with his wisdom, connected with this skill in living that would show the Corinthian community what does a right way to live look like? How does one look like when one is connected to God spiritually, manifesting the fruits of the Spirit? Those same fruits that should be manifest in this congregation. The love, the joy, the peace, the forbearance, the kindness, the goodness, the faithfulness that is part of our community, the gentleness, the self-control. That is what Paul was encouraging that Corinthian community of Christians to look like so that they could reflect the heart of God in an age that was passing away, passing away quickly. So this is what Paul is trying to communicate to the Christians at Corinth. I need you to live differently. And you could imagine uh, how their minds were rocking and reeling as, as Paul was calling them to a better way. You could imagine how the minds of those who had not made a commitment to Christ were rocking and reeling, under, coming to an understanding that God has not called us to live this way, that living this way is an affront to the Lord of glory. But there is an old adage that says, the more things change, you've heard it, the more they stay the same. And so, America today looks a lot like Corinth. America today looks a lot like Corinth, and we can see the elements of decline that give evidence to that. We have the breakdown of the family, an insatiable craving for pleasure, and the decay of religion in our nation. All the things that guide us towards destruction are very prevalent in America, just like they were prevalent in Corinth. And so the message that Paul is preaching is just as relevant to us as it was to the Corinthians in the first century. As it relates to the breakdown of the family, currently only 22% of American households can be described as traditional families where there's a mother and a father. Just 22%. In 1960, it was 73%. 73% of all children were living in a household with a mother and a father. By 1980, the number had dropped to 61%. And as I said already, currently is at 22. We were spiraling downwards. At present, the definition of what constitutes a family is changing as now the LGBTQ community is incorporated into this idea of what constitutes a family. As we become more tolerable, things become more intolerant. Legislation based on the new concept of family is having an impact on our nation as well. Now we are wrestling with the idea of whether or not men can participate in women's sports. This is ridiculous. But it's also a part of that tolerant community that we've become as we redefine what it means to be a family. Sadly, four in ten births occur to women who are single are living with a non-marital partner. This means there is no longer a dominant family form in the U.S. We have totally rejected God's definition of what it means to be a family. The traditional family is out the window, is moving out of the window with every passing generation. Well, what about our craving for pleasure? As a nation, America is in a moral free fall. In this free fall, it was, believe it or not, it was, it was addressed, it was, it was kind of predicted by George Washington, of all people. George Washington tells us what's going to happen to a nation that disconnects morality 
from God. He says, of all the dispositions and habits which lead to political prosperity, religion and morality are indispensable supports. And let us, with caution, indulge the supposition that morality can be maintained without religion. Whatever may be conceded to the influence of refined education and educated minds of a peculiar structure, Reason and experience both forbid us to expect that national morality can prevail in exclusion to religious principles. And when they were saying religious back then, they meant Christianity. There can be no morality without God. But that is a lesson we are steadfastly rejecting. And that is what we are going to pass on as an inheritance to our young people. God forbid. God forbid. America is no longer looking to biblical truth for moral guidance. In the American Worldview Inventory conducted in 2020, only 29% of American adults say they look to the Bible when they are making moral choices. 29% of adults interviewed said they look to the Bible for moral guidance. 61% said it was unacceptable to renege on a small debt owed to a family member, but we could only get 47% of them to believe that it is improper to lie. This, again, is the direction we are going. And as we look at what is happening with our teens, the numbers get worse and worse and worse. We are not getting better. It will not get better. And then there is the decay of religion, the rejection of Christianity specifically and religion in general is common in our nation. And as we accept pluralism as our new reality, it shouldn't surprise any of us that we are moving in a direction where religion is rejected altogether. And that is the direction we are moving. In 2019, only 65% of Americans describe themselves as Christian. This represents a drop of 12 percentage points in 10 years. 12 percentage points in 10 years. It's just downward from there. Self-described atheists are now 4% of the population, up from 2% since 2009. It's one of the fastest growing groups in America, non-belief. And the young people who have described themselves as the nuns, we have no religion has increased from 12% in 2009 to 17% in 2020. So many of our young people are rejecting faith as a rational way of viewing life. And this doesn't give us time to discuss the impact of education or even wayward philosophies, but all these things are weighing in on us, even as they weighed in on the Corinthians in the first century. And yet God gives us a cure for this malaise, for this moral morass that we find ourselves in as we continue to read Corinthians. God says that we are his hidden mystery. Though the world is passing away, the church is still the hidden mystery that God will use to spark a revival in the hearts of those who will hear. And that's why it's critical for you and I as unbelievers to begin to seep deeply into our souls the wisdom of God as it relates to how we should live so the world can see an example of how it benefits the people of God to live like the people of God. And we can continue to be that mystery that the world looks to and draws them in. Those who will hear, draw them in 
to a personal relationship with Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. So we cannot underplay the importance that you and I have as members of the body of Christ. We are the lifeline to those who are lost. God says you are the lifeline to those who are disconnected from him. But if we cannot be those mature Christians, then a broken world has no one to look to when there's a desire to be saved, when there's the question of, is there a different way to live? Is there a better way to live? You are supposed to be an example of that better way to live. And yet, when it's asked of children, what is one of the factors that pushes you away from a relationship with Jesus Christ? I've told you this before. And it should break our hearts. They said our parents, because we don't see evidence in the lives of our parents that God can change people. And we'll touch on that towards the end. But you've got to be that city on a hill that doesn't just draw unbelievers, but it draws your own kids into a relationship with Jesus Christ. And the reason I know we're failing to do that is because each generation is less and less spiritually inclined towards the Christian faith. Each generation. And so there's evidence that we're not doing something right. What are they missing? Here's what those who are separated from God are missing. That verse that says, I has not seen, and ear has not heard, and that which has not entered the hearts of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. That's what they're missing. When God tells us that it hasn't even entered into the hearts of man, he's saying that that which is most central to the spiritual and physical life of us as individuals. It's not entered into our deepest, the deepest recesses of our being, what God has prepared for those who love him. That's what they're missing. And that is the bridge that you and I are supposed to be to those who are lost. Because as we continue on, he says he has opened those deep things to us. He's opened those deep things to us that we can in turn relay them to them. Not by just what we know, but how we live. Because remember, the word wisdom means one who skillfully manages his or her life. And we're drawing on God's wisdom as it relates to this skillful living so that those who are, again, disconnected from God can see it. You are the lifeline. You are the lifeline till Jesus comes. You are the lifeline. Now, I don't mean to place this burden, in a sense, on you, but I do. But I do. Because as you and I buy in, walk into the wisdom of God, he says what? My yoke is easy, and my burden is light. In other words, he's going to walk with you. He's going to walk with you and he's going to help you carry that responsibility of being a follower of Jesus Christ, of being a light to those who are lost. The scriptures also tell us that as we move deeper into this relationship, that his law is not a burden to us. The more we get into God's word, the more we get closer to and living out the wisdom of God, the easier it will become for us. The more we will begin to enjoy it. And those who are disconnected from God will see that we enjoy our lives. There are a lot of people out there that think once you become a follower of Christ, the joy is gone. But joy is the fruit of the Spirit. 
they don't know anything about joy. They might know a lot about pleasure, and the pleasure that leads to death, but they don't know about joy. But your responsibility is to show the joy that we experience as we follow Jesus Christ as our Savior. And this wise living opens us up to the deep things of God. That should excite you and I, that we have the privilege of entering into a relationship with Christ that allows us to experience, to know the deep things of God. That means we are not superficial people. You are not called to dumb down as you enter into a relationship with Christ. The deep things of God are yours as we walk hand in hand with him. And so when we say eye has not seen, ear has not heard, he's not talking about us. You have seen, you have heard. God is opening the doors to the wonders of life as you enter into a personal relationship with him. It is not so with you. And he does it as we receive his spirit. I said earlier, this isn't something you can fabricate on your own. This is deeper than just passing on information. You're not going to get it because you come to Sunday school, though I would encourage you to come to Sunday school. But it's deeper than that. It's deeper than uh, life groups and, and on and on and on. I'm not saying you don't need those things. We need those things, but it's deeper than that, as we move into this deep, intimate relationship with Jesus Christ, God says we will come to know him. And that word know, you know, sco, uh, sometimes it's used of an intimate relationship between a husband and wife. God says he wants you to move into the realm of intimacy with him. And as you move into that realm of intimacy, your eyes are opened to the wonders of that relationship to the wonders of life and he pours out he pours into you these deep things through the spirit and again it's deeper than just an intellectual exchange between you and whomever and then in verse 12 verse 12 brings us back to verse 6 and 7, and it reminds us, it reminds the world that this cannot be done without the Spirit of God moving in our lives. This is one of the reasons the world doesn't understand it. They don't see it. This is why it's foolishness to them. They can't grasp spiritual things with a carnal mind. And that's what's going on in Corinth. And that's exactly what Paul is telling them they can't do. It looks like foolishness to you because you're trying to grapple with the things of God with your carnal intellect. But God tells us, no, no, it's the Spirit of God who knows God, who's intimate with God, who knows the thoughts of God, and he's willing to bring that intimacy to you so that you can understand and then communicate to those who are lost that same intimacy that they can never know apart from him. They will never know apart from him. You see how messed up our government is? But that's men and women coming together trying to solve problems apart from an intimate relationship with God. They will never get it right. They will never get it right. But you... You can get it right. And you can pass that on so that others will have an opportunity to get it right. That's how we evidence that we are a mature body of believers. We are walking closely in God's wisdom. We're sharing it with the world and we're sharing it with one another. All that love and joy and peace that togetherness, all of that should be manifest. It should be obvious when we come together. And I know we do a good job of that. 
All I have to do, for those of you who were here, is remind you when my life turned upside down. And after 30-some years of employment, I found myself unemployed. Unemployed as an, not an old man, but an older man. <laughs> and, and you see how difficult, you know, I didn't believe in age discrimination until I became aged and then start looking for another job. Then I start to believe in it. But this church, without me ever asking, came alongside Karen and I, and they carried us on eagle's wings. I'm not ashamed to say, we didn't go under because of this church. There were people that sent us large sums of money because God was touching their hearts and teaching them. This is how we become a community of believers. This is how we bear one another up. This is how we evidence the maturity of walking in the wisdom of God. And as I shared God's blessings with unbelievers, they were just blown away. They didn't know there were people like that. They didn't know that there were people that loved God like that, that were willing to pour in the lives of brothers and sisters as we walk in the wisdom of God, as we walk in the wisdom of God, filled by the Spirit of God, connecting to the Word of God. Now, I'm going to close in a few minutes, but I think I would be remiss if I didn't give you an idea of how we could walk more deeply in the wisdom of God, more closely to the wisdom of God. If I didn't give you some elements of application that are not beyond any of us, any of us, all of us, can and should do these things. There's six things that I want to share with you as I prepare to close. How do we do this? should be the question on all of our minds. How do we manifest that maturity in the community of faith? How do we manifest that community to those who are outside the faith? How do we live in such a way that makes, makes us attractive to those who don't believe? That will cause them to yearn to step through the door and say, I want to see what this is all about. How do we create that? We do that. Now, again, this list is not um, all-inclusive. There is so much more than what I'm going to present to you this morning. But I believe this will move us in the right direction. And this is not going to knock you out of your seat. Because I know you've been doing this yourselves a long time. I'm just encouraging you to go deeper in it. The first thing I would encourage you to do is read your Bible. You cannot know the mind of God and be disconnected from the Word of God. It is not possible. But I want you to first read it for pleasure. Read it for pleasure. And then I want you to take the next step, and I want you to study the Word of God. I want you to go from reading for pleasure to studying God's Word. This will help us uh, take in that deep, deep mystery of what God is talking about as you study God's Word. And then the Holy Spirit begins to move in your life and makes studying a joy. Because if he doesn't, it will become tedious. I know I got tired of reading the word because I couldn't read for pleasure. It was always study, study, study. And then you get to the point where oh, I don't want to do it because now I got to figure out what's a verb and what's a noun and what's a gerund and what's a, you know, on and on and on. I couldn't read for pleasure. So I, I don't want you to... I don't want you to study to the extent that you can't read for pleasure, but I do want you to read for pleasure, and I do want you to study the Word. And then the third thing I want you to do, because we're going deeper, is meditate 
on God's word. And again, this will take you deeper. You're going to have to, with all of these things, you're going to have to set aside time. You're going to have to figure out what's the most advantageous time for you to do those things. For some of you, you still have young kids. And kids are not always conducive to reading and studying and meditating. So you're going to have to figure out when's the best time for me to do this. Read the word, study the word, meditate on the word, and then pray. Pray. I don't pray enough. I'm working on it. Especially after meeting with the pastor in our our meeting last week. Uh, I've come to understand just how lacking my prayer life is. So I'm beating up myself. One of the things we can do in our prayer, there's an acronym that I like to use that might be helpful to you, and you've probably heard it. It's called ACTS. As you think of this word, you think of the book of ACTS, it can help you process your prayer through this acronym. The A stands for adoration. And here you tell God how grateful you are, how much you love him. And then the C stands for confession. You bring your brokenness to God as you seek his forgiveness. The T stands for thanksgiving. You're thanking God for not only what he's done for you, but what he's done for your friends or your family. And then S is for supplication. You lay your needs before the Lord. So you can use that acronym to help you pray through um, as you interact with God. Then I want you, your family wants you, your family needs you to live the word. Live the word. That's what your community needs. That's what your family needs. They need to see you living the word out in your life. Because again, you are the only bridge they have through the Holy Spirit to a relationship with the eternal God. And then finally, as the the band comes up, um, you need to teach your family to do the same. And this is how we faithfully pass on to the next generation our Christian faith, because it is obvious we are not doing it now. We scarcely see it in millennials, and then we move to Generation X, And then sadly, Generation Z, we're running out of the alphabet, which might mean we're running out of time. (laughs) But if you will pass your faith on to your kids, we might be able to raise another generation that will give hope to our nation, to our communities. May God... Bless each and every one of you as you strive to live out 1 Corinthians 2, 6 through 16.